The topic of the symposium that I was asked to contribute to was how can the humanities inform tech policy and design to foster healthy democracy and discourse online? So you can imagine I got this and I thought I need to (laughs) deconstruct all of this and say, what exactly do we mean by democracy? What do we mean by healthy democracy? And I basically, I did the same sort of thing that I was figuring I might do tonight, which is jump back to the 19th century and to the beginning of uh, electronic mass communication, which was the telegraph, and look at how people reacted to the telegraph and the, the sort of fears and hopes and excitement that it aroused and how that sort of echo is echoed in the disputes now about the internet and democracy. And let's start with the uh, historical context of what we're seeing right now in terms of these kind of Twitter wars. Yeah, well, the, the Twitter wars are very interesting, maybe in small part because I use Twitter and I often enjoy it. But I've always sort of been cognizant that you have to be very careful about how you look at a platform like Twitter because it's privately owned, it's for profit. And there are people who are designing it and operating it who have certain interests and profit motives. And there's a conflict, I think, going on that maybe in a way is coming to a head, but people aren't really still aren't really conscious of it, that there's this conflict between Twitter being some sort of a public service or part of the public forum and at the same time being a private for-profit corporation. And what the, and you know, I'm sure most of us have heard about these Twitter files that are being dropped bit by bit and how some of the kind of inner backdoor workings of the relationship between Twitter and the state are being brought out into the open. And there's a long history behind this, which goes back most certainly to the telegraph, if not even earlier than that. And the thing is, the Constitution mandates that there should be a postal service and that it should be a public service that allows the conveyance of messages among the public at cost, right? So it's inexpensive. And when electronic communication started to come along, beginning with the telegraph, a lot of people just assumed that those media, too, would also be public services, that they would be democratically you know, state owned and that hence the basic rights that are associated with the post office would also apply, like the right to your messages being private and the right to freedom of speech because it, it would be a public service. But that didn't happen. And I looked back and I researched because of that paper I was doing for Yale. I researched about Samuel F.B. Morse, who invented the telegraph. And he was one of those people. He assumed it would just be taken up by the Postal Service and it would just be an update to the Postal Service and that it would be a public service. But Congress didn't want to do that. And he had to really campaign hard just to get Congress to allocate some money to build an initial experimental line between Washington and Baltimore to sort of prove that this technology could work. But then once they'd done that, they basically just left it to the private market and allowed private corporations to build the whole system and operate it and charge whatever rates they wanted. And the the advantage to the state was that then that meant that those constitutional protections didn't necessarily apply. So Western Union became the big monopoly corporation that controlled that system. And Western Union just read people's telegrams, didn't tell them, didn't respect their privacy, banned people, shut people out from using it. They created a monopoly in AP where they said only reporters and newspapers that are part of AP are allowed to use the telegraph. And they basically controlled information, didn't have to obey these uh, First Amendment or Fourth Amendment. And there was even a Supreme Court case saying, yeah, Western Union can read your telegrams. You have no right to privacy. You have no right to freedom of speech. It's a private company. And that really set the precedent, right? And the advantage to the state was that then when Western Union wanted to, they could take political actors' telegrams, read them and hand them over to to their opponents, their rivals. And this happened, for instance, in the disputed election of 1876. They just took Democratic politicians' telegrams and showed them to Republican congressmen in Congress as basically a way of bribing them. 
So you see how there's like a bargain that formed, right? Where the state said private companies can run these systems, can control them as monopolies. If in return, they spy on people, uh, censor people that the state wants them to, right? It gives this sort of backdoor channel, right? And I think you can see that precedent now being repeated with the internet. And the internet is the most similar to the telegraph because it's a multinodal open network, right? There's no single point of broadcasting like you have with radio or television. It's this open network with, where messages can go back and forth among multiple parties. And when the state looks at this situation, it scares them, right? They say, well, how are we going to monitor or control or censor what's going on on this open network? And so they follow basically, whether consciously or not, they follow basically the same precedent that happened with the telegraph. They said, we'll create it, right? DARPA created the internet or, you know, Al Gore, <laughs> if you want to right. listen to Al Gore, right? The, the, the government put in the initial funding and research to start this technology. But then they said, all right, private companies, you take it over. You do what you want. We'll let you have monopolies, which is, you know, Facebook, Google. These are Amazon. These are monopolistic companies. You can have that power. We won't break you up. We won't take you into public ownership. We'll let you make profit. So long as you give us this backdoor and tell us this information about who's saying what to whom, and as long as you suppress right information or ideas that we don't like, that some, that we see as threatening. So it's a similar sort of bargain that I think you can see has developed now and kind of echoing, echoing the Gilded Age, right? And that's what I see a lot of this coming down to is that we are in this sort of new Gilded Age. Yeah. Can you expand on that, that idea of the new Gilded Age? Because people are, are bringing this up a lot. Yeah. I mean, there there has been scholarship now that sort of disputes the received wisdom about the Gilded Age and have shown how there was a lot of contestation. There were movements for reform. But basically, it was an era where people had to reckon with conflicting ideas that, you know, there was this Victorian wisdom that th the market will solve things, right? This was the original Victorian liberalism, right? That we talk about neoliberalism today, because in a way, it's sort of a revival of Victorian liberalism. But, you know, the market, just let the market work. Uh, it'll respond to incentives. But then what ended up happening is a few huge monopolistic companies under, often under the control of a few families, right? And like I was talking about Western Union, they were initially controlled by the Vanderbilt family and then were taken over by Jay Gould, who, you know, was no better. <laughs> but people looked around and said, well, this isn't really turning out the way we thought. We're actually seeing this sort of draconian, sometimes authoritarian control of the economy by small, a small number of consolidated companies who, when push comes to shove, usually also have the backing of the state who will, you know, use force of arms to control workers, to suppress competitors, et cetera. And for a long time, there was just a lot of uh, confusion and struggle. And some of that, you know, a sort of new philosophy had to develop then later in the progressive era, which, you know, also is open to criticism in its way as well. But I think we're seeing the same sort of crises repeating now, where people, as the New Deal era slowly is you know dismantled uh, and there's this return to sort of faith in the market people are saying you know this this isn't looking like what we thought it would be you know things things in the 21st century are not looking the way we were led to expect like in the 1990s at this moment of optimism after the end of the cold war so i think it's really that kind of inner conflict that really echoes the gilded age Hmm. And I think you can see that in this anxiety about the internet, disinformation, conspiracy theories, you know, sort of the monster is coming to life. What are we going to do? Uh, and kind of the confusion about, well, what, what, do, what do you want Twitter to be? Or what do you want Facebook to be? Are these public, part of the public sphere? Or are they just private companies that can do whatever they want? It's very confused. And also when it comes to labor issues. So that was that was another big thing. I don't know if you want to talk more about. Yeah, definitely. 